The World's Yearling Sale. Make plans for the Keeneland September Yearling Sale September 13th through the 24th. Visit theworldsyearlingsale.com to learn more. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, September 8th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and our long national nightmare is over. Football is back tomorrow night. Hi, Joe. Bill Finley, a correspondent for Thoroughbred Daily News. And I, too, am going to weigh in on a sport other than horse racing. On Monday, I went to a baseball game in my beloved Fenway Park. It took five hours, five hours to complete this baseball game. Yeah, that's a good way to get young people interested in your sport. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I know that fall is upon us, not because of football season, not because of the pennant races, not even because, you know, the Saratoga meet is over. It's because it took me 20 minutes because I was stuck behind a school bus. It took me 20 minutes to get my Dunkin' Donuts this morning. <laughs> not usually following school. John, you, do, you do have a tough life. I feel so bad for you. Sometimes. I know, right? I know. Well, that that, you know, that extra 15 minutes it took me could have gone to preparing for this show. So there's going to be gaps now and it's going to be on, you know, on the school bus kids because of that. <laughs> those, those damn kids getting those damn John kids. and his material. I'm, I'm finally the old man in town. Like my kids are through the school system. And now I'm the one who's like, I'm not paying taxes for this damn school system. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the old man on the on the front lawn yelling and screaming into the, into the ether. <laughs> I'm taking you after Bill. The TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland, home of the World's Yearling Sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. Time's running out. It starts next Monday, September 13th. You can learn more and see the catalog at theworldsyearlingsale.com. So it's always a bittersweet weekend at Saratoga and Del Mar to, to close the meet out. It's obviously great racing, but, you know, it's just like like the rest of the world, Labor Day weekend, or the rest of America, at least Labor Day weekend signifies the end of summer. And it was an absolutely tremendous summer of racing at Saratoga and Del Mar. We're going to wrap the, both meets up um, in a little bit. And I think they were both very, very positive, especially with fans back. Um, but the the centerpieces of the weekend were the the great ones for the two-year-olds, but also the Jackie Club Gold Cup and the Flower Bowl on Saturday for older horses at Saratoga. You know, just as, a, as an old school Belmont race goer, it's, it, hurt, it hurt my heart a little bit. I got to be honest to see the Jackie Club Gold Cup and the Flower Bowl at Saratoga. I just... You know, those, those those used to be really, really big races that were like the, the center of the Belmont meet. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the Woodward's going to attract quite as much attention, but I get why they did it. Anyway, the winner of the Jockey Club Gold Cup was Max Player. We're going to talk to Steve Asperson in a little bit. The story of the meet with Steve Asperson and just the just absolute monster performances for him. Jackie's Warrior, Max Player, the two-year-olds. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. Max Player, I thought, you know, the difference for him, the last two races, because he was a little bit of an early developing three-year-old that hit a wall last year, got a couple clunk up thirds in the Belmont Travers, but overall did not do a lot of running after the Withers last year. I think the difference for him has been Ricardo Santana using his speed, and I'm going to beat this dead horse again. You know, there's another great aggressive ride by Santana, and aggressive riding pays off, gentlemen. You know, he took it to Forza Dioro early. And, I, you know, I liked Forza Dioro. I'm a fan of his, but I thought he was pretty overbet at even money in that race, considering how little he'd accomplished. Um, and Santana and Max Player didn't give him a breather. And if he drops back and makes one run, I think Forza Dioro gets away with a much easier pace. Max Player probably can't catch him. Um, and aggressiveness, aggressiveness pays off. Part infinity plus one. You know, your horse doesn't even necessarily have to have, to have a ton of speed on paper. If they break well, in a paceless race, go and get some forward position. And that's been the difference for Max Player, I think. Getting him involved in the race early, it happened in the Suburban. He showed a lot more speed than he had ever in his career. And he's just a much better horse when you're able to keep him interested early in the race. That was my that was my main takeaway from the Jockey Gold, Gold Cup, I thought. Forza Di Goro may be a little bit disappointing, but I think mainly it was because Ricardo Santana and Max Player Kept the pressure on him from the jump. Didn't feel like anybody else did any real running, but you know, Max Player has turned it around because of the the use of his speed. What do you guys think? I, I, you make a good point there because every time I look at this horse, I, I what's going on here? And I'll give you guys each a hundred guesses. 
You can't tell me who beat him in the Pimico special where he was six feet and eight lengths in a grade three race that nobody yeah. cares, hasn't cared about since 1934. And now he's literally in the equation for horse of the year, the conversation anyways. I mean, if he wins the Breeders' Cup Classic and a couple other things happen, could it? I see John shaking his head there. Um, but I, I don't, I have no idea. Maybe it is the speed. Maybe it is, you know, something like that. Or maybe just Steve Asmussen. And we'll, it's one of the first things I want to ask him when we get him on has figured out a way to turn this horse uh, around. But having said that, I'm still not going to go overboard on him or, or think he's going to win the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, his buyer numbers are, are pretty modest. What, a 102 and was it a 101? Uh, in the 101 in the Suburban and a 102 in the Jack Club Gold Cup. So, you know, whatever has happened with this horse has been kind of remarkable. Forza de Oro, no excuse whatsoever. Um, Happy Saver, no excuse whatsoever in finishing second. I don't think these are the horses we're going to be talking about post uh, Breeders' Cup Classic. But, you know, maybe the training job of the year, of all he's done well this year, or all he's done very, very, very good, maybe the best training feat of everything is what the heck did Steve Asmussen do to turn this horse around, Max Player, and, and put him up into the, you know, the higher echelons of, of the older horse division, older male horse division? Um, you know, it, it's a fascinating story. Mr. Hyper really strikes again. <laughs> you can't say the horse ran a 101 and 102 buyer and beat Modest Fields and then yet, but he's going to be in the running for horse of the no, year. No, John, if you had listened to me, I said, if he wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, Right. He wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, and 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 um, uh, Lutruska runs lousy, and a couple other things happen. He could be a horse of the year. That's all I said. If you and had actually listened to I me, I listened. I just I just was shaking my head because my brain was rattling so much when you said. Something I know like he's that. no That's, he's no gamin, but you yeah, know. he's no gamin. He's not even close. He's not who even. Is? But who is exactly? But that, that's like saying if he wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, he'll be Horse of the Year. If if my aunt had testicles, it'd be my uncle. I mean, that's, that's oh, just, there's, no, there's no way that that's going to happen. But be that as it may, I don't want to take anything away from Steve S. Mewson as far as his training ability and what he's done to turn this horse around. Because if you remember, this was the horse that um, Linda Rice had originally. And Linda, um, the story goes, at least, that Linda you know, told um, George Hall, the owner, I don't think the horse is good enough to run in the Derby. And he said, thank you very much. And moved the horse like the next yeah. day to Steve Asmussen. And then the horse ran a suspect fifth, I think in the Derby and like ran fifth or sixth in the, in the Preakness, ran fifth in the Preakness. And, and you kind of say, yeah, you know, the horse really didn't deserve to be in that group. They brought him overseas. He ran a very lackluster 11th um, in, you know, in the Saudi cup. Then they brought him back in the Pimlico special. And like you, uh, you know, said, Bill, he, he ran a really poor race then. Um, and I think it, it has to be that they put him on the engine, like Joe said, and that's made the difference where, you know, it, it's the, you know, come and beat me, come and beat me, you know, Nick's go style, basically, or Truska style. Um, and using this, you know, giving the horse the advantage of using its speed. If you look even in the breezes um, of late, everything's a bullet breeze. Everything is on the engine, on the engine, on the engine. Um, and, and that seems to be the, uh, the best tactic for a horse like this, but, you know, look, I don't want to take anything away from the horse because he won a grade one. And that's always really, really, really difficult to do percentage wise. It just doesn't happen that often. Um, but horse of the year, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think Bill's just so happy to have his voice back that he's just <laughs> saying, you know, he's, he's just like, Oh my God, I feel so free. I can say whatever I want. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it just, there are certain horses that you, they lose interest if you, you know, let them lag back too far and they just, you know, you can get a little bit of run out of them, but they're just, you know, I just, I think some horses just, they want to be up with the leaders and be engaged early. And that's, that's the way to, to keep them, to be, they make them run their best for the entirety of the race and finish the best. I think that's, that's the case with him. And again, Cardo Santana, like, I think it, it has been a, you know, a, a defined, um, kind of tactic from Steve Asmussen, but Ricardo Santana wins a lot of races because he's aggressive. And I just, I, I gotta, I, I gotta beat that horse again. One more time. Like I'm just so tired of seeing, you know, grab fest, especially on the turf. Aggressive riding pays off nine times out of 10. So I want to move on to a couple other results, you know, warlike goddess in the flower bowl, yeah, I thought that was an interesting kind of performance because unlike the other races, she was not traveling that well early. 
and was was kind of ranked past the stands for the first time. And, you know, I just, it, it, you know, she's supposed to be, beat that field no matter what. But I, I got to say, if you if you had her two to five, weren't feeling that great the first time around. You know, she just she was fighting Julian Leperu a little bit. Um, but she did save all the ground. And, you know, if, if she was at all right, she was always going to trounce those Phillies. Um, and she's obviously unbeatable amongst her peers going 11 for longs it up. Um, and it was great to see her get a grade one, especially it's a thirty thousand dollar OBS June purchase. Like that's 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 a pretty damn good training job and a good you know yeah, good how, how about, for Joe. How about didn't even get a bid at the Keeneland September sale? Didn't even get a wow. bid with a thousand dollar RNA, which means you did not get a bid. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, just, no, no, that's yeah. great. That's that's great info. Yeah, wow, I didn't realize that. But um, but she's a Keeneland grad. She's a Keeneland grad. Thank you. So that's you know that, that's right. <laughs> Thank you for the sponsorship. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's crazy. That is that is that is wild. I didn't realize that part of it. Um, but yeah, it's always good to see overachieving horses like that. Um, I, you know, as far as the Breeders Cup goes, I think her her chances kind of depend on whether the top Euro fillies go to the turf or the Philly and mare turf. Because as good as she is, you know, I just I don't think she's anywhere close to matching up with some of the top. Phillies and mares um, in Europe, in Europe, like snowfall, we're going to get to see this weekend and love and a couple of other, like, I just, she's not going to be able to stack up to those horses, but if those horses decide to go to the turf, you know, she, she could be the horse to be in the, in the Philly and mare turf. Um, but I'm sure they'll cross that bridge when they get to it, because, you know, she's already accomplished a ton in a very short amount of time. And she, she debuted less than a year ago. She debuted as like a late developing three-year-old at the end of September last year. And now she's six for seven with four graded stakes wins and a grade one. That's pretty, that's pretty damn good. So hats off to George Krikorian and especially Bill Mott, who just had a monster weekend. We're going to get to a couple of his other non-graded stakes horses in a little bit. I mean, it's a very exciting time to work in the, in the Bill Mott barn. Now, as far as the two-year-old stakes go, the story is obviously Gunrunner. And I just, I, I don't know. I don't have the stats for this. We need, we need like a, a crack researcher instead of John, who's just a researcher on crack. Um, it, where Gunrunner had four different graded stakes winners this summer. How is that even possible? There's only six graded stakes total in the summer. And he had four of them with four different horses, which is absolutely incredible. He swept the grade ones at Saratoga. He had Echo Zulu on Sunday and the spin away and then Gunite on Monday in the, in the hopeful, both ran very well. I thought Gunite ran a little bit better in terms of the circumstances where you have kind of forced through a fast pace and to come up inside horses again, Ricardo Santana decided to use the horse's speed instead of taking him back. And it worked out. Um, but just, I, I can't remember a freshman sire ever starting like this with this many top level horses. Um, what did you guys think of the rest of the stakes action? Yeah, even I don't pay any attention to pedigrees. I've been really impressed by what Gunrunner is doing. The only thing I, I would add to that is, well, first of all, I, I, now John rained on Max Player's parade. I'll rain on Gunite's parade. Uh, and I wrote in my week in review this morning, I hope winners just don't do anything over the last four or five decades when it comes to the Triple Crown. It's just, it, it doesn't fit. It's not the kind of race won by a horse that's going to go on to be successful in the Triple Crown. Look at Jackie's Warrior is a good example, who's turned out to be a fabulous horse after winning the hopeful last year. but. You know, they, they figured out very soon into it that he was not that kind of horse. I wouldn't give up on Wit Joe. I mean, I know he got trounced by this horse, but he had a bad trip. I mean, he got banged around a little bit at the start. But down the back stretch, he's, I think he was nine, um, about eight, nine lengths behind. I mean, at that point, he was really going to have to be sensational, absolutely sensational to get the job done. So I, I think we'll hear a little bit more. Um, I, I wouldn't give up on him. And I think maybe, actually, I would say, out of the, the hopeful horses, I still might think that he's the one that most likely to have a say on what goes on uh, next spring and in, in, in the road to the Derby and, and the Derby itself, but, but we shall see. But um, yeah, I, I mean, and, and I know we're going to talk about it, but you know, just the insanity of, you talk about the insanity of gun runner, the insanity of Steve Asmussen winning grade one stakes race on three straight days at Saratoga, finishing up with Gunite and winning five over a nine day period, uh, going back to the prior weekend with, with um, uh, Jack, including Jackie's word, the Alpine's victory was, you, you know, um, I, I'm getting a little bit off subject here, but even though Chad Brown won the training title, Steve asked me. Was yeah. That's, that's the wonderful thing about our business is that you look at pedigrees, you look at sire lines and you say, 
Gunrunner didn't, you know, really start developing until his four and five year old, you know, years of his of his career. And I know it was by design. You know, we we had a great interview last week with Winchell who said, you know, we knew he wasn't going to be an early two year old, so we gave him time. And and that's all true. If you would have said to me which of the freshman sires are going to have multiple grade one winners, not even four, but multiple grade one winners, there would have been a handful of other stallions I, I personally would have picked. And I think the general, you know, uh, group in, in, you know, of, of horse racing fans and, and experts would have picked ahead of Gunrunner because he was a later developing horse. Um, so to have this kind of early, um, you know, uh, uh, great results. And it's just mind blowing. Um, and he's doing it all over the place. He's doing it across the country, Colts and Phillies. Um, and it seems like that they should be getting better as they go longer. And, and I'm really looking forward to when both Gnite and Wit run a mile and then go two turns. I'm assuming they're both going to go head to head in the champagne, um, the win and you're in, you know, one turn mile at Belmont. Uh, you know, that next next off. But, you know, it could be setting up to be a really, really interesting Breeders' Cup because, Bill, I agree with you, both horses, actually, I think as the as the races go further, both of them are going to really, uh, you know, take that in and enjoy that. Um, there, there's no, you know, they're not front running sprinters that are kind of hanging on. Um, and as impressive as the hopeful winner was, how about Echo Zulu? And I know it was a different day and there was some, you know, different, maybe different track surface uh, you know, because of the rain. But Echo Zulu actually ran three fifths of a second faster, pretty much in a hand ride also from from gate to wire. Um, and, and, you know, she, as she won the spin away and the spin away, I think top to bottom maybe wasn't as deep of a field as the hopeful. But I think it's safe to say that Echo Zulu was equally as impressive as her male counterpart in winning the spin away. Um, and I think the Frisette going one turn is really going to play right into her uh, wheelhouse. Um, it's going to be tough to beat her in the Frisette, which also is a win in your end. Yeah, uh, we're setting up for, for a great Belmont fall, I think, with a lot of very nice two-year-olds. We're going to get to a couple of them in a little bit. There were a bunch of rising star performances over the weekend. And not one, but two three-year-old sprinters that ran 114 buyers. So that, to me, is is at least equal billing with the graded stakes over the weekend. And we're going to get to it after this message from Keeneland. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Spendthrift Farm. Another honor for the country's top sire, Intimissive, won the Saratoga Sires title. We've been running that in the TDN throughout the meet, and you know, it was probably a foregone conclusion that Intimissive was going to win, but he's, you know, because he, he's at the top of every one of these lists. But obviously, a great honor to be the top sire at Saratoga, where everybody's pointing and all the all the really expensive and, and well bred babies come out. You know, into Mister Still is there's nobody in his class, and I think that that's going to be the case for a little bit. So um, he had 14 winners, which topped Uncle Mo by one. Um, and this was the first year that TDN has had those statistics, and it's it's obviously a very interesting, very intriguing meet. I hit it a bomb. Had a really exciting winner with Tis the Bomb in the Kentucky Juvenile Mile Stakes at Kentucky Downs. Uh, for Kenny McPeak and Phoenix Thoroughbreds. He's a little bit of an under-the-radar radar turf sire who I think can get some nice horses. Golden Sense, you know, another another horse that maybe doesn't get the top billing of his sire and a couple of the other Spendthrift Stallions, but continues to put out runners. Um, and he had the winner of the grade two John Maybe stakes with going to Vegas. He's the leading fourth crop uh, sire this year. Uh, and the first crop for Bolt Dora, we've talked a lot about him. Um, he's got 67 yearlings. At going scheduled to go through the ring at Keeneland September. Um, he's, he's the sire of a $1.4 million Saratoga yearling already, which is the highest price for a first crop yearling this year. And don't forget about Yapon, who almost got his ear bitten off. Um, at least he's going to stand at Spendthrift for the 2022 breeding season, and he's going to go for the Breeders' Cup sprint um, at Del Mar after, before retiring at, at year's end. And they're really stacking up those t- top potentially champion sprinters at Spendthrift and Yapon is another one as a son of Uncle Mo, who I think is going to be very, very popular. Um, so lot, lots of action for, for Spendthrift and the, the roster only keeps growing. So normally we wouldn't do a segment 
for just a couple of allowance winners on their own. But this was, you know, this was a weekend where you saw two, at least two performances that I think you're going to remember for a while, especially if these horses go on to do big things, um, two, three-year-old sprinters. And that's another subplot is just, this is probably the best class of three-year-old sprinters I've ever seen. Um, in my life, we saw Jackie's warrior and life is good. Go at it a week ago in the Allen Jerkins. But this weekend you had two horses coming from totally different directions, totally different purchase prices. We ran 114 buyers, one at Saratoga and one at Del Mar. One, I think was a little bit more expected, although you never expect the 114 buyer out of anybody, you know, flight line is just, he's honestly one of the most powerful moving horses I've ever seen in my life. And I want to give a major congrats to, to West Point. I mean, they got to be through the roof going, you know, watching this horse and, and, and having this horse for the future. And West Point has a couple of, of other partners, including Summer Wynn Equine on this horse and Sienna Farm. I'm sure forgetting one other partner, but what an absolutely dynamic horse he is. And, you know, the, the, I think the goal, I think uh, they're being smart and the connections and John Sadler are being smart and they're not going to try to force him into one of the Breeders' Cup races. I think this is, you know, this is the kind of horse that is going to have a huge, huge four-year-old season and also can possibly go further. He's only gone six furlongs so far. I think he's, he's got the breeding obviously by tap it to go longer. So I think it's smart for them to take it slow with him. The goal is going to be the Malibu instead of the Breeders cup and then try to make that a launch pad for an enormous four-year-old season because, you know, his talent is, is absolutely generational. You just don't see horses run 108 at Del Mar and just run away from his other rivals stride by stride. He just widened with every stride. He was under very little urging and I think he's going to take the world by storm as a four-year-old if he can stay healthy. He was, he was absolutely mind-blowing to watch on Sunday. And, and as soon as he hit the gas, you know that race w- was over in the blink of an eye. And you just don't see that on dirt. You don't see that, that kind of turn of foot. And it's just, it's just crazy to look at a, at a horse's past performances and see 105 and a 114 in their first two races. It just does not happen. And, you know, we're all fingers crossed that, that he'll stick around and stay healthy because he can be a once in a lifetime talent. And I, I, I guess I congratulations to West Point and everybody just for, for finding a horse like this. Um, even if you had to spend $1 million, plenty of people spend a million dollars on horses and don't come up with horses like this for their entire lives. But then the other side of it is a horse who could have been had for $10,000 just a couple of months ago in Baby Yoda. He was debuted in a $10,000 maiden claimer, one off by eight or nine lengths, um, and is now also a potential superstar. He was in a Saratoga allowance on Saturday and ran away to, I think, a four and a quarter length victory. He was 114 buyer as well. And I think this was a very shrewd private purchase by Adam Wachtel and Pantafel Stables and those guys off an allowance third at Pimlico. They didn't buy him off of the debut win. They bought him, at least in terms of the past performances, what they say. Maybe they were in talks after the debut win, but the past performances say it was after the third he ran at Pimlico. And I think that's that's pretty shrewd to be able to, you know, follow through with that horse even after he didn't win. Um, so this kind of illustrates the fact that a good horse can come from anywhere in this business. You can pay a million dollars for one. You can potentially pay whatever these guys paid. You know, couldn't have been a ton more than the ten thousand dollars he was he was up for in his debut. Um, and then both buyer figures make sense in terms of the, what the horses behind him uh, had run. So it's not as if you know. So it's one of these races where you see this horse explode forward into this figure, and then everybody beneath him also ran a career best. Makes you a little dubious. These figures made sense. I mean, I was blown away by both of them, especially Flightline visually. What do you guys think about having this, th- these horses break out like this and also just joining this monster, monster three year old sprint division? Yeah, I mean, not only are both really good horses, um, they're, you know, fascinating horses, uh, particularly because of their background and how they, you know, came from both sides of the tracks, so to speak. Um, Flightline ha- has a clear path. You know what he's going to do because the Malibu is an obvious goal. I would imagine John Sadler's going to try to find an allowance race between now uh, and then. The only thing I would say, this isn't a knock, but is he perhaps one of those horses that's too fast for his own good? I mean, John Sadler actually even kind of mentioned that a little bit after his maiden win. He didn't reel him back in, in a month and try to get him ready for you know, something like the Allen Jerkins, when he said, you know, this horse ran so fast, I have to give him more time. But having said that, I, I mean, he has 
for a horse that has not even run in the stakes race yet, he has as much potential as, as any horse you, any of us have seen in a long, long time, especially if he can stay healthy and if he can go long next year. I mean, it's just, you know, you can't even begin to imagine uh, what uh, he can do. Now, you guys, are, particularly John is, is a pedigree expert. John, um, who the heck is prospective? The sire of Baby Yoda, who stands for three thousand, and as Joe said, broke his maiden for ten thousand uh, dollars. Now he's a gelding. Um, you know they're going to just try to obviously get him into races where they can make a lot of money. But you know, again, things that you you don't see happen. You know, a horse that won a starter allowance race. You talked about uh, Joe. He broke his maiden for ten comes back and runs in a start allowance race in Saratoga, which is, you know, for glorified claimers, and then comes back and runs this off the charts races. You know, this is just, I, I suppose, just one of these genetic flukes or something. Well, Bill, it's funny you mention that because I do know about perspective for two okay. reasons. Number one is we actually had before Baby Yoda, we had the best perspective that was out there with a filly named Cece Valentina um, that we bought privately two years ago down in Florida after winning some Florida bred um, steak races. Um, you know, down in the uh, down in the Sunshine State, and Mark Cassie actually trained Perspective and won the Ohio <laughs> Derby, and there was another uh, one of the the minor state derbies that. that Tampa Bay Derby. You should thank you. I should know that. that. I should I should yeah. know the Tampa Bay Derby. Yeah, duh. Um, Names on the trophy. I the, now. And I think the horse made like three quarters of a million dollars. Um, so you know, so he's got the uh, son of Malibu Moon. I think he is. So he's he's got the. The, the genetic chops to be, a, you know, a decent sire. I mean, obviously he's not standing in Kentucky because he didn't win a grade one and, and he doesn't have a lot of the female family that a lot of the um, farms want to have. But but he's he's a legitimate regional sire. He's a legitimate horse that, that can throw a good one. Now, Baby Yoda, the interesting story in my estimation about him isn't even that he ran for the Maiden 10. It's that he ran for Maiden 10 and there was a horse that was claimed out of that race. So somebody was looking at the horses in the race. Dale Capiano actually claimed the horse that ran third in the race. And so he watched all the horses. It wasn't like, well, who cares about a Pimlico Maiden 10? Nobody's there. Somebody claimed the horse out of the race. So somebody watched all of them come in and he passed over Baby Yoda, which on its name on its own, you would think would at least you know raise an eyebrow because Baby Yoda is so cute. The real Baby Yoda is so cute. Um, anyway, so... There was somebody who claimed a horse out of the race. Baby Yoda then went on and won. They managed him properly and started our allowance. And, you know, if you would have told me that, hey, a horse this weekend is going to run a 114 buyer, I would have thought of 120 horses, maybe 130 horses ahead of Baby Yoda. Um, and that's no disrespect to, to Baby Yoda, but just there's no way he would have been on the radar screen. Flight line, yeah. If you said somebody's going to run, uh, you know, somewhere around a 114 buyer number, who is it going to be? You say, OK, yeah, it's the million dollar son of Tappet out in California um, that ran a 105 and should theoretically, you know, step up from from that because they gave him the right amount of time and everything. But, you know, Baby Yoda is just such an interesting story. And again, just like Warlake Goddess, another horse from the wrong side of the tracks that is coming up and just eating people's lunch um, at the dinner table. Hey, Joe, real quick, just to put this in, into perspective, um, you, you talked about the buyer numbers. So at 114, Baby Yoda and um, Flightline are literally, according to buyer, the fastest horses to run this year. They're faster than Nick's Go, who is, has the fastest dirt number of anybody, that 113, which is what that was, that Prairie Meadows race. And among the three-year-olds, essential quality, you know, the uh, horse that is on has already clinched the three-year-old championship and won a uh, classic race in the Traverse with a 109. Now, is Baby Yoda a better horse than Essential Quality? I'm not going to go anywhere near something he's like not that. Gonna be, he's not going to be horse of the year, Bill? Well, he could be if Max Player doesn't come through in the three years of classic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, put that into perspective. And he's five, five points faster than Essential Quality. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, that's a good point. That's a really good point. No, I mean, I noticed that too. John loves saying Baby Yoda so much. I think we are going to have to Photoshop John's face. <laughs> Onto Baby Yoda just for this episode. Yeah, please yeah. get on that graphics department. We appreciate it. Um, you are. You are. Mm. Oh, that was a pretty good impression. Wow. Damn, why don't you do that at the top? Because, uh, you know, I didn't know we were going to be putting this much time into Baby Yoda. Instead of complaining about the kids getting in your Dunkin' Donuts line, you should have done your Baby Yoda impression. That would have been better. Um, all right. But, all, but just I wanted to mention the runner up in that race, too, for Bill Mott. Like Bill Mott runs one, two, and he's got Olympiad who was second and ran a one Oh five buyer. 
Like right. you imagine running, you imagine coming <laughs> off that layoff, a year layoff, and running a 105 buyer and your second, like beating four and a half lengths. Like that's that's a pretty amazing thing. And and yeah. think about think about what Bill, this is what I was referencing before. Think about what Bill Mott has unveiled at this Saratoga meet. Not to mention more like Goddess and all the great stakes horses. Baby Yoda, 114 buyer. Yesterday, Olympiad, one oh, or Saturday, Olympiad running second to him, 105, in his first start against winners off a year layoff. And then Speaker's Corner as well, earlier in the meet, with that dominant win, and is gonna, probably going to be in the Pennsylvania Derby next. So it's it's a very, very exciting time to work in the Bill Mott barn because the future is extremely bright with these three-year-olds. And it's just like, you know, from all different directions, like you guys said, I, I, it's it's a very interesting game in that way that there's no guarantees. You know, West Point they, and the partners, they shelled out a million dollars for flight line. And it looks like it's going to work out in a big way if he can stay healthy. But there's plenty of people who spend a lot of money on horses that do not work out. And, you know, there's plenty of $10,000 maiden claimers going on all across the country. And you never know which one might be housing the next superstar. That's why we love the game. And that's what keeps people coming back. Um, just a couple other performances I wanted to mention. It was a very busy weekend for a TDN rising stars. We had four, um, two on Saturday and two on Sunday. We had Annapolis on the turf for, uh, for Todd Pletcher, um, was, uh, son or daughter. Was that a son or daughter of Warfront? Um, son, son, of son, Warfront. son of Warfront. Um, one off pretty impressively, uh, yeah, Corniche at, at uh, Del Mar, it was a cult by quality road, road, very, very expensive, $1.5 million OBS April topper for Speedway Stables and Bob Baffert. Also was a rising star on Saturday um, at Del Mar. And then on Sunday, we had Classy Edition, uh, progeny of, of Classic Empire. It was also a little bit of an up and coming first crop sire. She's a daughter of, of um, Classic Empire. She cost a lot. She was a $550,000 facing uh, Mid Atlantic purchase. And then um, the fourth one was Cairo Memories at Del Mar, who was a daughter of Cairo Prince. It was 16 to one going two turns on the turf and uh, dominated her rivals at Del Mar and became a rising star. So four rising stars. And also there was another Brian Lynch horse by Giants Causeway who ran really, really well in a live looking maiden field, got a 90 buyer, um, like somehow got lost at 13 to one, even though the horse was running six, was breathing six furlongs at 112. That's the kind of loaded race it was on paper. You breathe six for as long as a 112, you end up at 13 to one. And he just popped out to the run under Jose Ortiz and kept going one by like six and three quarter lengths. So what an exciting weekend of performances that bode well for future stars. But all of that pales in comparison to the weekend and the week that John Green and DJ Stable had, which started with Coinage, my, my, my good friend Coinage winning the with, with anticipation, first time on the turf, Got out to the front and stop me if you've heard this before. They crawled along on the on the lead. But with that being said, he did finish like a big time horse. I think came home in 28 and change, you know, slow pace or not. That's you got to be a real runner to be able to do that. So congratulations to you guys. Um, and also had the first Aragi winner. Um, at Saratoga on Monday. So that was, that was pretty exciting. You know, I was, I'm, uh, I was a little disappointed that Eric gets gotten a little bit of a slow start as a stallion. Um, but you know, for adversity going turf to dirt, I thought it made a lot of sense on paper and I was, I was happy to see you guys get that done, but I uh, might have one or two other results, John, that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Improving strategies ran second in the, in the red bank in at Monmouth park. Um, which was which was really fun to actually run a horse in our backyard and 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 that was exciting. Um, and then we had a, a first time starter empire maker named Queen Judith who won at Kentucky Downs um, and and got up and uh, you know Julian La Peru did a phenomenal job of, uh, of of guiding her through some traffic and and running in a very boggy kind of yielding turf course there um, and she got up. So we may have I mean I'm not going wood when I say this but we may have four horses. Um, that are, you know, running in uh, Breeders' Cup preps in the next couple of weeks, uh, all, all two-year-olds between Coinage, who ran 85, uh, buyer in the with anticipation, Queen Judith, we got Diabolic up in, uh, up in Canada, um, Maceto is running uh, today at, uh, or sorry, tomorrow at, at uh, Kentucky Downs, he's a horse that we bought in Europe, and, uh, and did I say Lemieux, and Lemieux is going to run in the Pocahontas. Um, at, uh, at Churchill Downs. So 
Um, you know, Mark Cassie's done a great job for us, you know, training wise. And uh, Kim Valerio has helped us pick out a lot of these horses. And interestingly enough, the, the classic empire that that uh, that one that you just mentioned that was a 550 um, purchase was actually on our short list. And, and we, we didn't go to 500, but we went pretty damn close um, because we liked that one as well. And of course, Mark Cassie trained classic empire. So um, he felt very comfortable with, with the pedigree page, but not good. Things are coming together. And, and I think it's all because, you know, Bill Finley keeps throwing out the gauntlet of, Hey, the, you know, the horse of the year is wide open. You know, you better start winning some races. Hey, gas up the plane. Daddy That's wants right. to see Del Mar. That's right. That's right. We may, we may have to do a show from the plane actually, because <laughs> yeah. we'd be flying out on that Wednesday. Uh, hopefully because uh, if futures futures Friday is, you know, is, is the day before the big day. So we'd ha- we would have to go out on that Wednesday. So um, buckle up. I mean, Joe, I know you're, you're an old pro you're, you're like, you know, exactly what to order and stuff. And, and Bill, we'd, love, we'd love to have you on there, Bill, if, if, if uh, <laughs> you know, if you're frequent flyer miles uh, transfer. <laughs> Can't wait, man. I'll hold you to that. But yeah, big bright future for DJ stable and a bright future for a lot of those rising stars and three-year-old sprinters over the weekend. It's just, it's great to see it's great to see these 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 potential future stars that you get to now follow and it, it becomes appointment viewing when they run. I just, I don't know, it just feels like in general, there's a ton of really, really nice horses running and, and that had a lot of breakout performances over the summer. And it's just, there's, there's a lot to be excited about pretty much across the board for sure. Um, so we'll be right back after this message from Spendthrift Farm. CDN Writers Room is brought to you by Woodford Thoroughbreds. A couple of exciting two-year-olds this summer from last year's Keeneland September sale uh, consignment from Woodford, including Dr. Jeff, broke his maiden in his first start at Saratoga, and Turner Loose, who broke her maiden in her first start and came back to win the uh, Aristocrat Juvenile Stakes Monday at Kentucky Downs. Kentucky Downs in the full swing now and focusing on the upcoming books one and two of Keeneland September. Woodford's really excited. They have uh, about a Curlin Philly um, out of Las Carina, who has hit 36. Curlin obviously has had an outstanding year as he does every year. Um, he ran one, two in the Alabama. Las Carina is a distorted humor half sister to the incredible blue hen broodmare, just whistle Dixie produced nothing but basically graded stakes horses. Um, they've got an uncle Mo Colt out of the mother goose winner, grade two mother goose winner, unchained melody. Um, you know, he's a, you can see him on the screen most likely right now. Woodford thinks he's a superior physical, super mature. Uh, Hip 778 is a candy ride colt out of multiple grade stakes producing dam. Uh, candy ride obviously is establishing himself. He's already established himself as a superstar sire. Now he's really establishing himself as a sire of sires. Gun runner is proving that every single day, it seems. Um, Hip 991 is Street Sense out of Candy Crush, a cult from a big female family. Hit 1059 is by freshman sire City of Light out of Fashion Runaway. Um, Also, Woodford diversifies. They got the breaking and training highlights. Don't wait up was their sixth maiden special weight winner at Saratoga alone. So, you know, if you have breaking and training needs, Woodford will hook you up there as well. And also great stakes putting placings for, uh, for little Tootsie Kevin's folly, who was third at a big price in the, uh, in the hopeful and some like it hot Brown who's just a really hard knocking turf horse ran great in that Kentucky downs race, arguably best in there considering the pace he had to run up on. But as far as the, the hips coming up in Keelan in September for Woodford, I know John has his eyes on a couple of them. Care to expand on that, John? Yeah. And, and you mentioned a couple, I'll just, I'll just go into book three. Cause I, I had a chance to look into book three a couple of days ago and there's two Phillies in particular There's an uncle Mo Philly out of uh, stainless hip 1681. And the reason why I thought this was one was interesting. It's obviously uncle Mo, which is, you know, proven to be one of the, the great generational sires that we have, but the mayor stainless is a flatter. And I love flatter as a broodmare sire. She not only finished second in the Jessamine, but third in the Skyler bill. So she turf and dirt, uh, you know, had had impressive, you know, races on both turf and dirt at two of the premier racetracks in the country at Keeneland and Saratoga. So I'm curious to see how that Philly looks. And then 1726 is an American Pharaoh Philly um, out of a Bernardini mare via Villaggio, who was a multiple grade graded uh, stakes winner. And uh, one of her early foals is this 
uh, American Pharaoh Philly. So two horses, 1681 and 1726, that I'm personally looking forward to seeing when I'm down there, uh, where, where, when our representatives are down there, I should say, uh, for book three. That's so fancy. You send your, rep, you send your reps down there. And the DJ stable is loaded now with all these <laughs> results. Look out. Look out, Keelan September. They're, they're, they're high on life and ready to spend some cash. Um, but yeah, so good luck to Woodford. Uh, obviously, great consignment. And we're all looking forward, forward to that sale for various amount of reasons. And, and we'll see what John actually picks or his representatives actually pick for, from that consignment. Looking forward to it. And so we did not have a lot of news on the crime beat. We got the we did not have the police blotter segment really roll in the last month or so because there's been so much great racing. And honestly, honestly, it's been a breath of fresh air to be able to talk about some of the good things and the exciting things that we love about racing. But our criminal master, alleged criminal mastermind snuck into the news in the past week. Jason Service and Jorge Navarro. Uh, there was there was a first of all. Uh, service was suing, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago to try to get the government's wiretaps thrown out because I think he's sweating bullets now because all the other guys are turning on him. And that's the that's I think that's the crux of the evidence that the government has was these wiretaps. And a bunch of them got released. You can read them on the TDN website. It's the number one story right now uh, from T.D. Thornton. And, you know, I'm not I'm not, not going to get, get too deep into them because, a lot, first of all, a lot of them are nonsense. A lot of them are just like very difficult to understand and, 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 you know, figure out what the hell they're talking about and who they're talking about. But in general, it just, what, what struck me was, you know, when this, these indictments first dropped and we first started talking about it, I really, you know, you had this idea of them being these kind of evil geniuses who were like, you know, knew exactly what they were injecting their horses with. And were like, coming up with these synthetic compounds in a lab and like testing one in a beaker compared to another one, see which one works better. They did not know what the hell they were injecting into their horses. They were just listening to their vet who said, listen, I got this, I got this other horse and this other trainer on this and it's working really well. Here you go. Just use it. And they didn't know like, honestly, any of the details or even any of the names of what they were, you know, allegedly injecting their horses with. And that was like, that to me, I think, you know, did not reflect well, not just on them, but also on the enforcement in racing that these guys who were not geniuses and were really just kind of, you know, goons, I think, you know, that's, that's what they came off to me in the text messages was just criminal, alleged criminal goons um, were able to so easily evade whatever regulation or whatever investigation arms we have in this sport. And that's, you know, it honestly made it even more embarrassing, you know, I, you know, they did because they didn't have to have this masterminded plot to get around racing's enforcement mechanisms. This was just a couple of guys who decided to break the rules, found the right vet and just, you know, plug their horses allegedly with drugs until someone finally cared enough to pay attention and start knocking on their do their doors. What do you guys say? Yeah, I mean, obviously not the two sharpest knives in the drawer here with these guys, um, Joe. And and yeah, I, I mean the the just randomness of what they were doing. I mean, they would just they would apparently just take the kitchen sink. If somebody says this stuff will make the horse run faster, we're going to use it no matter what. Um, but also, one thing you didn't mention, it was good that at least with service, he was started to to realize that his success was too good to be true. And one of the quotes in there was. Um, I'm scared to death because these horses are running like crazy. So at least he had the, I, I don't know, wisdom or the, the sense to realize that, you know, maybe someone really will do something about this because you're just not supposed to win 38% and have, you know, $16,000 uh, maiden claimers go on to win cross the wire first in the Kentucky Derby. Um, so, you know, that was interesting about that. The other thing too in there, and I haven't really seen much about this before, and I, I really I don't quite understand or know what to make about it, but they, they made references to what they were calling irregular clembuterol. So apparently, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, impact of clembuterol was not good enough for them. They needed like super clembuterol that they were going to give to their horses. And, you know, uh, again, so, you know, what what weren't they throwing into this concoction that they were giving to their horses? They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it did. They didn't care. And also, you know, we're being a, 
a little bit kind of, um, you know, wise guy-ish here. I don't mean to be a wise guy about this, but think about the dangers to these horses. You know, you're just going to just throw drugs at them and you don't even know what they are or what they do. And, you know, we don't know for sure. That's probably why XY Jet is dead today. No question. And, and you know, the, the, the somber part about all this lunacy is that the end users, the athletes, didn't have a say in what's going into their bodies, didn't have a say into what was being ejected, what was, and, and quite frankly, the, the trainers, and, and if you go on the backstretch and you ask trainers, why do they use certain things? Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are going to say, well, because it worked on so-and-so. And it may not even be a horse in their barn or maybe anecdotally something they heard. Um, but most of the time, and, and the vets aren't evil people for the most part, but most of the time it's the vets are coming in and saying, try this. It may work. I saw it work. It kind of works. And, and the trainers and the owners also say, you know what, for 50, 100 bucks, whatever, I'm going to try something that may help my horse, um, you know, and, and may make them a little bit better. Now, most people fall within the rules and will only use the stuff that is, you know, it is, is legislated and allowable, um, you know, with, within the confines of the racing rules of their respective states. Um, but on the trainer's exam, you don't have to, you know, there's no science section. There's no chemistry section. There's no veterinarian section on there that, you know, that enables them or makes them understand what is going on um, you know, when they inject a horse or when they give a horse supplements, um, it, it's basically, OK, I think this is going to work or someone so is telling me it's going to work. I'm going to try it. Um, so, it, you know, you, you, you wonder sometimes why would a trainer use this, you know, fill in the blank supplement or, or injectable on their athletes? Most of them really don't know. Most of them don't know why they're using it other than just that they've heard it could work. And if it could help, I mean, if you if you basically said, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a sugar water because it'll give the horse a little bit extra, you know, oomph down the stretch. I think a lot of trainers would try it just to see if it would work. Yeah. And, you know, we're being we're being flipping about it just because, you know, it's there's something like weirdly satisfying about seeing what adults these guys were, you know, even though it, it doesn't reflect well on the industry in general, it just, I don't know, there's some, there's something about these text messages and, and kind of how incoherent they were, they were that like, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's, it's kind of satisfying to see alleged criminals sound like such morons for the entire world to see. Um, hey Joe, you just, don't need to call Navarro alleged anymore. Right. right guilty, right. A criminal right. service alleged to borrow a criminal. Yeah. yeah. Can we put up, can we put up like a chart here? Yeah, of, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So far, um, just little check marks. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's obviously a very, very tragic thing too, because they just, they didn't care. They had no, no, they, they hadn't like really no, com they had, they had no fear of what would happen to their horses. They had no concern about the, the well being of their horses and, and what could happen to them that to me is is the most awful part and you just you read this stuff and you're like how do these guys sleep at night you know it's just i don't know how you even get into that mindset where you're doing something that's so obviously wrong and, and evil and, and underhanded and they're just casually talking about it and like you know it's just it's not that big of a deal it's you know it's just it just it seems you would read these texts and think that this is like a regular job like this is just a regular thing that everybody does because they're so casual about it. But the other thing too, and Bill Bill mentioned it was, you know, service talking about how nervous he was, nervous service um, talking about how nervous he was because the horses were running so well. That to me, that really struck me because it's like, have you ever considered just not cheating? Right. Like you know. The, you're so nervous about the horses running well and the attention that's coming and, you know, these claims that are running through the screen, like why not just not cheat for a little bit? Like why do you have to win at this kind of percentage that, you know, you're admitting is going to attract negative attention and scrutiny to you. It's just, I, I don't understand that compulsion to cheat and to, to, you know, allegedly drug horses because, you know, first of all, it's wrong morally, but even beyond that, if it's bringing this kind of attention to you, just stop, just go be a regular trainer. Like you already have built up enough of a reputation for being a high level trainer. 
that your your owners are still going to stick with you if you're only one in at twenty five percent instead of thirty five. It's just it, it was a really it, it was a window into the mindset of these guys that it became a lifestyle for them. I think to you know allegedly drug and cheat and and you know dope up horses that it just it didn't even it didn't even occur to them to be like you know maybe we should pull back on this maybe we should not cheat for a little bit. It was just no, let's not win as obviously as we have been and then maybe the the attention will die down a little bit that i thought was really striking and you know really really talks really you know speaks to a a systemic problem in racing where guys feel like they're above the law and the only thing that they think could possibly stop them is if the horses are running too well like that's that to me is is a big issue and you know it was it, it was satisfying to see these guys look like total morons but it's just it, it doesn't reflect well on racing that they were able to be morons and still cheat the system, allegedly in some cases, for so long. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse, every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. Owning a potential superstar, mega, galactic star like Flightline is attainable with a racing partnership with West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. Just wanted to mention a couple other results that, that West Point have, had over the weekend. Cavalry Charge. Won the sixth race on Monday at Kentucky Downs for Dallas Stewart, which was a $162,000 allowance race. Huge purses, obviously, at Kentucky Downs. So congrats to the partners there. And they also had two winners at Del Mar with Ascot Storm and England's Rose on back-to-back -back days. But the the news is about flight line. And I think, you know, not just for West Point, but just the racing world was so abuzz with flight line's performance on Sunday. We said he got a 114 buyer. He ran four consecutive quarters of 22 seconds which I don't, you know, when, when, when does that ever happen? Like, I don't know, maybe once in a decade, perhaps. I mean, that that's, that's really running and it's going to be so exciting to see him going forward and see him, I think, try to stretch out gradually. And, you know, like I said, I think he's, if he can stay healthy, he's going to take the world by storm as a four-year-old in 2020, in 2022. And he's just, he's absolutely blistering the racetrack and is, an, is a joy to watch. So best of luck to the partners for the rest of this journey with him, because you guys got a hell of a horse for sure. This Saturday is the uh, 20th anniversary of 9-11. It was obviously something that, you know, affected us all in the New York area. I was, I was a, but a wee high school freshman when, when 9-11 uh, happened and I was going to the school in, at, at Brooklyn Tech. And I remember it just, hearing on the radio and seeing everybody freak out and, and seeing the, the black smoke in the sky, you could see it for days and for miles. Um, so it's, it's obviously a time of, of remembrance for our city and also for the country as well. Um, but it also affected racing. Like we all remember the, uh, the, the tis now for America call from Tom Durkin. We talked to him about that when he was on the show at the Breeders cup classic. Here's the wire desperately close. Tis now wins it for America. It affected the Keelan September sale. Um, I Bill is doing a little bit of a retrospective 20 years, um, 20 years on from 9-11 about how it affected racing. That was like slightly before I started following the sport. I, I got into it around 2003. So I'm interested to hear what Bill and, and John remember from that time. Well, John, I mean, it affected everything in, in our lives and every facet of society, sports, business, et cetera. So I thought it would be interesting to go back and take a look at how horse racing reacted to this and, and what happened. So the 9-11 attacks happened um, on a Tuesday. And uh, uh, that day, every, as should have been the case, every racetrack in the country, I'm sure there's only a handful scheduled to race, did shut down. 
Uh, Belmont Park didn't come back until the following Wednesday. So the racing returned on September 19th. And kind of like with the coronavirus, it was the first sporting event in New York to come back. Uh, I believe on the 21st, um, Major League Baseball started up again with uh, Mike Piazza hitting that memorable home run uh, to win for the New York Mets. But uh, Naira had been used as a uh, staging area, emergency staging area with you know fire trucks, et cetera. And you know, reading back some of the coverage, I didn't cover that uh, the, the comeback uh, there, but I was reading um, our, all our good friends, Joe Drape, uh, writing in the New York Times um, about what it was like at Belmont that day. And he had one great quote, said that uh, John Velasquez got beat with, a, uh, still around, of course, uh, beat with a big favorite in, 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 after a race. And uh, one of the rail birds said to him, John, it's not the day to get on you. You know, so we're going to put aside the fact that you lost with a three to five shot uh, because obviously things are, are much more important than that. The other thing too, and, and you know, um, it was interesting uh, in reading this story, you would think that horse racing would have enough common sense to t- hit the pause button. New York did, and the Meadowlands also, that time running a for full thoroughbred meet did as well. But the day after 9-11, so on September 12th, Four racetracks in this country, including Delaware Park, ran um, on the Friday after 9-11. So that's what, three days later, 26 tracks ran. Um, that seems a little tone deaf to me that they, they couldn't have taken some more. T- I realized Delaware was not affected like New York was, but that they could have taken a little bit more time off. But, you know, horse racing, like everything else in society, um, you know, had was impacted by this. Uh, uh, Pat Reynolds, the trainer, uh, read that his wife um, worked on the 17th floor of the North Tower, did get out fine. I don't believe anybody directly involved with horse racing was killed in the attacks, but um, it was an, an awful time for not just horse racing, but of course for mankind. And and Bill, I, I hear what you're saying as far as uh, you know some of the racetracks plowing forward and and running cards and and I think just like now with the coronavirus. There, there was no playbook. There was no blueprint. There was no uh, way to go back and look and say, well, when this happened, we did X, Y, Z, and it caused these results, or maybe we should do it better. I mean, it, would, it was so out of the blue, so out of the uh, expected um, that something like that would happen that I think a lot of racetracks, not to make excuses for them, but they just didn't know how to handle it. Um, and, and, and that's why some of them went forward. Keeneland to their, to, you know, to, to their, um, um, benefit, uh, you know, they, they went ahead and they paused the sale. And I remember at the time, um, there was a lot of controversy going back and forth as to whether or not they should continue the sale as is because everyone flew in, um, you know, for the sale and all the horses were centrally located at the, you know, at the, at the sales ground. And we can't just have all these horses kind of in limbo. We need to move forward. We need to move forward. And they actually you know, push the pause button for a day. Um, and subsequently, since that time, that's why there's a dark day um, after the the second, uh, you know, book of the sale, second or third book, you know, year to year kind of changes a little bit. But basically, it's, it's the kind of reboot. It's the kind of give people an opportunity to take a step back and reflect on what's going on and push forward and look to see what's ahead. So, if there is a minor silver lining out of all this, it's that sometimes, um, you know, institutions in this case, like Keeneland looked at it and said, we're going to implement this time, this day off for everyone to kind of reboot and, and get their acts together. And then we're going to push forward and continue on with, with, with life as, as, as well as we can. Um, so, you know, I, I understand where Keeneland was coming from. The other thing that, that, that resonates with me is I remember, um, at that sale, usually when, before a sale starts, they go ahead and they do the um, prerequisites of all the rules and conditions of the sale and, and what goes on and how you bid and, and all that stuff. And it takes about 15 minutes. And before they did that, they actually played the national anthem, which they've never done before in my, in my lifetime. They played the national anthem and everybody stopped. Everyone in the barn area stopped. Everyone who was holding horses put them back. And everyone stood there kind of in in unity and listened to the national anthem with their hats off and with their hands over their heart for the most part. Um, And I remember thinking to myself that this is going to be an opportunity for the country to heal together because we feel together, you know, the the, the importance of being an American citizen and all that the flag represents. And you think about 20 years later, 
just how divided we are as a country, um, you know, compared to that day when after the 9-11 attacks happened and they played the national anthem at the, at the sale and everybody to a person stopped talking, stopped working, stopped what they were doing and listened and felt a part of a greater community and just how different it is right now with how divided we are. Yeah. And, you know, that that was kind of it, it changed. It, it changed New York. It changed America. It changed the world. And I think, unfortunately, for, you know, and I agree with John that there was that that brief period of, of unity and, and, you know, heartfelt patriotism and, and rallying together. And sports was a huge part of that. You know, I remember and then Bill mentioned the Mike Piazza home run. I remember the Yankees made it to the World Series that year. They ended up losing in seven games. But, you know, there was still there was still rubble, you know, 10 miles from the from the stadium. And it was just it was it was really moving to to watch people, you know, get together and, and cheer and, and, you know, rally and, and get their minds off of it. And I was actually at a playoff game that year. I went to a playoff game with my dad. Uh, Yankee Stadium, and I remember there was like there was like a jet fly, there was like a overhead jet flying thing, and it scared the crap out of me. Like that's where we, that's where we were at. That like any kind of loud noise or sudden, you know, it was just it, it you, your mind was in a totally different place where you felt like you were in a war zone, and we had never experienced anything like that in America. And I think you know, unfortunately, we I don't want to get too too political or too deep into it, but I think unfortunately we you know, America overreacted in a lot of ways and made a lot of really bad decisions that has, that have kind of gradually led us to this point where we're at each other's throats all the time. And, you know, it was never going to last forever, that feeling of, of unity and, and kumbaya, but this was, you know, it, it also opened the door to, you know, 9-11 also opened the door to a lot of really bad things that we inflicted on the world, we inflicted on each other. And it's, it's unfortunate that now we only, we only really remember that spirit once a year when we're, when we're commemorating 9-11 and, 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 you know, remembering the names and reading the names of all those who died, because it did make you feel like you were, you know, you were, you were part of a, of a community in America at that time. And you had to, you had to be your brother's keeper and you had to rally behind each other because who knew what was going to happen next? You know, it just, it turned the world upside down. Um, and you just, if you haven't, if you're too young or you don't really remember it, like this was, this was a, a an event where it was kind of like a delineation point, I think in American history, where it was before nine 11 and then after nine 11. And, you know, I think that's good. That's going to be the case forever. And it's, you know, there was a lot of there were a lot of uh, I think you know positive and, and uplifting things that came out of it in the short term, but I think in the long term, the legacy of 9/11 is that it it led us down a lot of terrible paths in America in terms of foreign policy and and, and wars and all that. But you know, just in general, it was it, it, just to bring it back to the original point. You know, Belmont and the Breeders' Cup and and New York sports were such a solace at, at that time, and that's why we love sports. You know, that's that's to me is is why sports is so popular and it's, it's, you know, the, the greatest enterprise in the world. It's that, you know, no matter what's happening, it can be a distraction for people, whatever you're going through in your life, whatever your country, your town, your city is going through, there's a game on, you all can show up and and root for a little bit and just forget about the heavy things that are going on in life and just, you know, get invested in something that in the end does not really matter one way or another what happens i think that that's what makes sports magical and that's what makes racing really important too and and i look forward to reading bill's piece about that because like i said it was a little bit before i started following racing but i do you know that iconic tom durkin call is burned in my brain and it was a very very different time and i I agree with john that it's a little it's a little tough to take you know the, the way america has kind of deteriorated in terms of the way we treat each other and how we don't look out for each other anymore in the way we did in the immediate aftermath um, of 9-11. But, you know, time moves on and we just we just got to keep getting better day by day. But it was obviously a very, very hard thing to deal with as a New Yorker. And it's something that that will never get over, honestly. Like there's a the 9-11 museum and I, I purposely have not been to it. I haven't been to the memorial because it's still it's still too painful. Like, and I, I've heard not great things about the museum, about like them replaying over and over the planes crashing into the building. Like, I don't want to see that. Those are my neighbors. I don't want to see a loop of my neighbors getting blown up in the Twin Towers. And I, I think that, you know, for a lot of people, it really affected them and it hurt them. But I think for, for most people, it hurt them because they saw it on TV. And 
as, as New Yorkers to have to walk by that rubble and to have to see all those the, the signs and the, you know, of people looking for their lost loved ones and hoping against hope that they, they would be found. You know, it was it was absolutely devastating. And it's something that we'll we'll really never get over as a city. And, you know, I, I think that everybody really should take a moment this Saturday, no matter where you are, to remember that day and to remember how it made you feel. And to, I think, hopefully have it be an impetus to treat each other better, because that's that's the main thing that came out of it initially. And it's something that's really gone away. 9-11 was a tragedy, but it should make you want to have each other's back as Americans and even as citizens of the world. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to welcome back in The Green Group Guest of the Week, seat Steve Asmussen. Thank you so much for coming on. Glad to be on. Glad to be on. All right. We're on now. Um, and so <laughs> you got to be on the, the biggest high of any trainer we've ever spoken to on this show. It was obviously an incredible summer, finished off with five grade one wins in nine days. I mean, it's hard to top what you did earlier in the, se- in the season by breaking that record. That's right up there. Can you just put into words what this summer was like for you at Saratoga? It just, it's extremely hard to find the words, uh, just the sense of pride. It, it just, uh, to be able to share this with the family and how the whole year it's, I think that the Arkansas Derby kind of taught me how to reflect on ground covered. And I've a feel that I've appreciated things differently since that happened because of what a unique circumstances that was to have that kind of success for the family can, you know, we've always done it. And then to set the record, which I've been aiming at for a, embarrassing to admit how long I've been trying for and for it to happen on Whitney day with Julie and the boys there. And then it was so, so nice and gracious then YRA Saratoga to include my parents in that moment. And the way it came together was just over overwhelmingly emotional. And then just the, the, positive uh, vibes that you just got all summer long from the racing public there at Saratoga, you know, being back at the races from the pandemic the year before, just what a perfect storm and just how you could feel it so much. And then, as you mentioned, five grade ones in nine calendar days for uh, unbelievable, you know, just can't, Scott Blasey and his crew and just the way things came together, we, you know, we're blessed with as best horses in the world, but they, they just showed up when it mattered most. And, uh, I was driving out of Saratoga yesterday, headed here to Kentucky downs for the races. And I could have got out and run around the car a couple of times. I was, <laughs> was so excited. That's great. Okay. Well, Steve, congratulations on all your success and thanks for coming on the show uh, today. I mean, we could spend 20 minutes on every one of the nine horses and then you would never you wouldn't be able to settle the rest of your horses uh, on the card at Kentucky Oaks. But the one that, that I, in my opinion, um, is was your best training job of the bunch was Max Player. And I'll go back to the Pimico special when what wasn't a very good field and he was not really even competitive. What is the difference between the Max special, uh, Max, Max Player, of course, of today versus that day? And I'll give my friend and colleague here, Joe Bianca, some credit. He thought it was because you guys are putting him into the race early. So if you could comment on, on the transformation of him and that theory that Joe had. 
I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and Joe, the, that is the key to, to Max Player, as you said. Um, I think uh, you, a lot, a lot of Max Player from the pole, very talented horse, keeps good company. You know, we're experienced enough and uh, fortunate enough to have horses that that is a quality horse, just how he is in training. Felt that he eliminated himself by not giving himself a chance away from the gates. And of course, you want to be closer. You're saying it, quit letting him eliminate. It. But that didn't work. Knowing what you wanted to do didn't. We took him back to the gates and pretty much started over from walking through to get hand opening to galloping him out, just like, like a young horse to, to lead the first three jumps. He was giving him taking himself out of the race. Also, one of the things that we learned with the Pimlico special thought it was the he's training well. He's of this quality. You mentioned it is in deep field. This is where we need to start back at. Shipped him in there to run. He didn't like shipping in, in close to the race. Got him to Belmont, let him settle, let the race come to him. Trained him at Belmont afterwards just to be sure that we were mo still moving forward off the big suburban win. Got him to Saratoga, plenty of time. Same thing. Um, quality horse that, like you said, we're figuring him out, needs to be in the race early, also needs to be where he's going to run with plenty of time to settle in. Gotcha. Well, you know, you were the story of the summer for sure, but if there was, if there was a sire who was the story of the summer, it was Gunrunner. He had four different graded snakes winners, which is just mind blowing for a freshman sire. Obviously your connection to him is very deep having trained him. Have you been surprised at all by his fast start? And what have you seen in his horses that kind of reflect him in your memory? The, the state of mind, the acceptance of what their job is. They, Gunite is the greatest example of what we want in a racehorse. Good a level of talent, learns from his lessons and improves. We, me and Scott were talking about him Tuesday morning and stuff. I mean, he ate up and just stood there like he was, when are we putting the tack on me, go to the track. Unbelievable. Just Gunrunner accepted who he was so well. The circumstances of a race, what you wanted him to do differently compared to how the track played or whatever. He allowed you. He understood the racing. That intelligence and the soundness for Gunite, five starts by Labor Day for a two-year-old yeah, and for him to be continuously getting better. Started off with moderate numbers, five-eighths of a mile. The further you're running, the better he shows. The, the hope, the hopeful, Saratoga, the circumstances in which you run there, it's, it isn't always just about ability. You got to handle what Sia's his horse in the race, jumped something, propped or something down the backside. Ricardo immediately took advantage of that. The second quarter in 22-1, and one, because of what had happened, but then for him to relax around the turn after he did that and take a little breather and then pick it up again, that's very mature and mentally, you know, a very smart horse, for especially for a two-year-old. Uh, Steve, I want to stay on the same subject. And if you look at Gunrunner, the racehorse, uh, one and a mile and a quarter, was a good two-year-old, but didn't hit his peak really till he was four. So it stands to reason that his offspring should not be winning so early out of the box. Have you allowed yourself to believe that they're going to get even better because of the, the factors I just brought up? It, it's truly amazing. Um, we it, all in on Gunrunner. Obviously, look what the horse did. I mean, his. I'm prouder of his form and how he late three-year-old year, his whole four-year-old year, his one race in the Pegasus of five. I mean, I think. A three, I'm a rag guy. Three was in his from that point over that sustained that many different racetrack circumstances. That that's remarkable. And just like you said, I mean, he matured into that. That understanding physically developed. The soundness that I'm seeing from the gun runners and these horses are allowing it. With we had dad had 20, I believe, gun runners at the farm this winter. Big, uh, visit there regularly, check on them. You know, we're all in on Gun Runner. This matters. Gunite out of a cowboy cow mare, a solid uh, sprint family, you know, kind of a sprint type body. Felt like we could be aggressive with him. He'd be one of the earlier ones. Wicked Halo, the filly that won the Adirondack, out of a mare that won the Adirondack, homebreds the Winchells. You know, the success continues. That's, I mean, the, 
what we were dreaming could happen did happen with that example. But the other gun runners that we have that are yet to unleash, that are out of mares, that are more like gun runner, we expect huge things from and are extremely excited about it. Um, talking with David Fisk, you know, the manager for Winchell and stuff, we've had we're the Winchell program is beautiful. The breeding program, the success they've had. But what David pointed out to me, which I thought was awesome, is we've had very good horses out of these families and Gunrunner has made them better. And how exciting that is. Like, you know, uh, uh, obvious, these are nice mares. That's what the, he was worthy of. But Gunite's family is listed stakes winner, sprint races, Midwest, that kind of thing. His mother won the bolted landing. You know, for Gunrunner to, to raise these solid pedigrees even that much further, you know, that's what you're so excited about. Definitely. And I, you, you mentioned the Winchell program. We had Ron Winchell actually on the show last week. I wanted to ask, this is kind of a two-part question, but when you broke that record with Stellar Tap, I thought it was perfectly fitting that it was a Winchell Thoroughbreds color bearer and that Ricardo Santana was riding the horse. That really has been the dream team, I think, especially in the last couple of years. Can you talk a little bit about what the Winchell Thoroughbreds banner has meant to you in your career? And then also the relationship you've built with Ricardo, who I think that you have helped elevate into a top rider. Well, I, mean, uh, I, I think you, you just, exactly. I mean, to think that you, this record you're aiming at for so long happens on Whitney day with a son of Tappet for the Winchells with Ricardo. I mean, the level of class Ron Winchell has is impossible to measure. Everybody's well aware of what the criticism I went through. I feel unjustly from, for whatever reason, the sticking true to who he was, how he handled that, us proving our innocence and just going about our business. Who, you know, how could you ask for more? The longtime Winchell, you know, his father, Vern, and my father having the same association. And then for us, we were kids back then. I mean, we were at the kid table when they were discussing what they were doing. And for us to have this level of success for Winchell to, you know, have the winner, the co-owner of one, and the breeder and the owner of the other, the spin away and the hopeful in the same year for the first crop of gun runner. It doesn't get any better. You mentioned Ricardo. I, it, I'm Everybody's well, I'm, I'm as hard to ride for as you possibly can be. For him to take the pressure, no excuses, want the performance, and to elevate his game to the level it is. Ricardo Santana, Midwestern rider, Oaklawn, Churchill Downs, to go to Saratoga and win five grade ones at the meet, top that. I mean, he, he's unbelievably gifted, as talented as anybody in the world. He's just he looked when he walks down the street, that looks like a jockey, you know, and he's put it together and he's performing at that elite level when it matters most, when it actually can be cashed in. And I couldn't be prouder of him, but he deserves it. Uh, he puts in the work. He can, every, you know, you don't win a race, this, that, and the other. You don't do something wrong. It, it's brought up, this, that, and the other. He, he learns from it. He shakes it off. He walks out for the next race, planning on winning it. And that is an uh, unbelievable, unique perspective. Yep. And aggressive, too. Aggressive riding, which we all love. I, I, trying to win. You know, it's yeah. in, in, in horse racing. I, you appreciate the, that effort is the quality in yeah. equines and humans that we have the most respect for. And that's what we get with Ricardo is effort. And mm -hmm. what could you ask for? Yep. Uh, Steve, going back to uh, your Travers Day, um, the two grade one wins of Yao Pan and Jackie's Warrior, are they on a collision course for the Breeders' Cup Sprint? And uh, if so, uh, what does it feel like to, you know, maybe know that you might have one horse to deny another horse in your staple in Eclipse Award? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that they deserve the opportunity. They just they came out of they came out of their wins in the Allen Jerkins and in the Forgo in great shape. I expect to run Jackie's Warrior one more time between now and the Breeders' Cup. But Yao Pan, you 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 see that how well he runs fresh, how the timing works for him. 
and he deserve he has earned and deserves this opportunity. Yep. I mean, and also I, I thought it was a great training job by you with Jackie's warrior, turning him back quickly, you know, after the Southwest, not pressing forward and trying to make the Derby turning him back quickly. But I know you're thinking about the Derby. You have to have a little more so of a thought in your mind about the Derby of your two-year-olds that you've had so far. You've got a bunch of good ones. Who do you think is best suited to that classic distance? If you're thinking about it. <laughs> you mean, as I'm thinking about it, not <laughs> exactly. That's what I was, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, about, that. I'm thinking about that when they're born, when they hit the ground. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, right, right now it's, uh, quite obviously, stellar tap off his the rec, the number nine thousand four hundred forty six and how he ran seven eighths of a mile. I'm anxious to get him to two turns. I don't want him and you. We saw the hopeful. Everybody talked about it. he was nominated, but that he he needs to avoid that forty four and change half mile. I think that long term that would not be beneficial to him. We're going to train him up to the Iroquois, the 18th of September at Churchill. He's got good pace, but he needs to get to two turns now and develop more of a rhythm. And the other horse that we also have targeting the Iroquois for obvious reasons is horse named Guntown, who is the gun runner uh, half to untappable out of Funhouse, And he, he has the exact same line as Midnight Bourbon did last year. He was third in the first seven eighths mile race at Ellis Park. And then he came back and won the first mile that they ran there and has trained really well since. I, I feel obviously Stellar Taps a sharper horse right now, a little more pace, but Guntown long term, he we're very excited about both, but that they're they are on a, they are both planning on running in the Iroquois on the 18th, the Churchill. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I mean, one last question since you brought him up. Midnight Bourbon obviously ran a huge race in the Travers. Again, aggressive ride by Ricardo, barely paid off. Uh, so what's the plan for him for the rest of the year? Well, um, he, we're considering running him in the Pennsylvania Derby. I think we're back on track to where we felt we were after the Preakness, the debacle of the Haskell. You know, what did you get out of it? Missed some training afterwards, just being sure everything was okay after that. and then. He, it would, I was so happy with how he came out of the Travers, how he went back to the track. And Scott Boyd, it, 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 they come back a lot better when they don't fall. <laughs> you, know, I know. You, know, so, yeah, you know, but he's it, right. I, I think we're right back where we were after the Preakness from a, a speed fitness level. I want to continue with that. You know, we got off track with what happened in the Haskell. Then we're back close near but for the travers the last quarter of a mile 23 and one in a dirt rate i mean that that's remarkable that's remarkable and with him not getting what you wanted out of the out of the haskell and missing some training afterwards missing some works you know went back to jogging and stuff but missing a couple of works at least it, it won't it be nice to just con- be able to continue and let him build on that instead of start over Yep. Yeah. And he's, he's definitely progressed throughout the year. And I guess, again, another good training job, I think. I, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Steve, if you uh, decide to play Powerball this week, can, you let me know? can I go in for half? Yeah. <laughs> Text us the numbers. Yeah. I, I did. I did. I did stop. I did stop at about at every state I got and bought a lottery ticket driving from New York. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're going to be lucky, be lucky. <laughs> All right. We might not have to jump on board those tickets. Listen, Steve, <laughs> always great to talk to you. Love having you on. I think you'll be smiling probably for a couple more months at least. Congratulations on an incredible summer. Thank you, oh, Steve. Thank you very, thank you very yeah. much. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Bye. Great to talk to you. Thanks, man. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Steve Asmussen will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website 
website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday was like the perfect, you know, bookend to a tremendous Saratoga and Del Mar meets. They were they were both great meets um, and they both set handle records, which is obviously a great thing. Saratoga handled over eight hundred million dollars for 40 days. That's 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 a big number. Uh, over twenty million dollars a day. Obviously, the fans being through the turnstiles again helped a ton. And it was just, you know, as someone who was actually at the racetrack this year, unlike these two bums who just flew in for the night to to do the show, it was great. It was honestly, it was it was really heartening, and it was it was there was such a buzz on the grounds, and there always is at Saratoga. But this year, it felt, you know, especially pronounced that everybody was just so excited to be there. Everyone was, everyone was in a good mood. Um, I think that's been the case this whole summer, kind of no, no matter where you go. Um, but it was great to see the 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 handle break records. Have Saratoga did not have great weather you know it wasn't terrible it was the worst weather you've ever seen but they had you know maybe 10 or so cars that that you know lost turf races there was a little bit of a heat wave um but overall they were they, the fans were always going to bet and support saratoga this summer but you i think it ex- even exceeded the expectations of the people at naira for how much they, they supported it and again it, it really helps to have that that uh naira's show and you know really promoting the show every promoting the track every single day and, and get it on people's minds, even if they're, they're not necessarily thinking of betting. And then Del Mar as well. The Del Mar meet handled almost $570 million for 31 days of racing. So that set a, a per day record at Del Mar last year. They, they had the record of 17.32 million. This year it was 18. 18- point three eight million. Um, and it was, it was, there was a lot of great racing and it was, it was just, I don't know. It, it, things started to gradually feel back to normal earlier this spring. We had fans at the Derby and the Preakness, but it was, it, I think that this was like the stamp of racing being finally back to full strength was the, the outstanding results at Saratoga and Del Mar. And it was obviously a ton to talk about it. We had a great time watching it all and debating it and cracking jokes on each other about it. And, you know, it's, it's the falls got a lot of good stuff too, but this was like the, the, like I said, the, the real, the real breakout, post COVID for a for the racing industry at Saratoga and Del Mar. And just to spin it forward to this weekend, you know, we got the big day of, at Kentucky downs on Saturday. There's five graded stakes win, uh, races. There's two grade twos, three grade threes. Can we get Kentucky downs a grade one American grade stakes committee? Can we bump up? Why don't you care what race it is? Just bump up one of these races to a grade one. They got a million dollar purses. They got great fields, big fields, you know, I think it's going to happen eventually, but you know, it's just, it's odd to see a million dollar race with a grade three tag on it. Um, I'm going to let John talk about those races in a little bit, because I know he's got some interest, but I also wanted to mention there's a lot, there's a, there's a couple of big races across the pond this weekend, um, including the Irish champion stakes, which is going to have St. Mark's Basilica in it. He's a three time uh, or four time group one winner um, for Aiden O'Brien. Uh, Poetic Flair is going to be in that race as well. Tarnawa, the last year's Breeders' Cup turf, really impressive. Philly is going to be in there as well. So that's going to be a great matchup at Leopardstown. Um, and then the pre meal where we're going to get to see Snowfall, who to me, I think is, is the most exciting horse maybe in the world, definitely in Europe. Um, I hope, fingers crossed, she's going to come for the Breeders' Cup. I know the main goal is the ARC. She's the 5-2 favorite right now for the ARC. She is just an absolute joy and a pleasure to watch. She just crushes her opponents every single time out there. She was, uh, Aiden O'Brien was considering running her in the Irish champion, but he's going to stick with the girls. He's never won the Prix Vermeil amazingly um, at, at, you know, in France. And that's going to be, I think it's going to be checked off his, his list very quickly this Saturday. I think she's going to make short work of that field. Um, and it's just, it's going to be appointment viewing. You have to, I'm going to have to set an alarm and make sure I watch snowfall. Um, so we're really excited about that. And I want to give a pop to all of our European listeners as well, um, who, who are, would probably know more about this stuff than I do, but I'm learning a little bit more and more. Of course, it's like snowfall, bring my eyes over there. And it, it gets me to pay attention a little bit more. So it'll be a great weekend over in Europe, but at Kentucky Downs, John's got a few few points and a few things to look for. Yeah, just on a personal note, we have uh, a Euro that we purchased over the summer named Maceto, um, who's going to run in the juvenile sprint 
uh, on Thursday. Uh, Masetto, uh, who ran third in a grade two and second in a grade three, and uh, we brought him over the pond and specifically, you know, pointed him for this race uh, because it's the European style turf course. We also have another Euro named Cheer of Sleepy Jean uh, that's going to be running on Sunday in a half a million dollar uh, stake race. That one came up really, really tough because the Saratoga equivalent canceled was one of the the few turf races that canceled the summer. Um, so we're running against uh, a couple of really well-bred and, and well-run horses so far. Um, and then you have the Franklin Simpson on Sunday, which is a grade two going six and a half. Um, that county final uh, front of the show, uh, uh, you know, West Point Thoroughbred owns and Steve Asmussen trains. So be curious to see how that Colt, that Greg Colt um, does on that, uh, on that turf course. Um, and then I think the most intriguing race for me over the entire weekend also, Sunday is the FanDuel Turf Sprint, um, where you have a number of horses that are trying to get some points and trying to get ahead of, uh, you know, of, of the uh, sprint you know, powers that be um, for the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. And you have Casa Creed in there, um, who, who, you know, who, who is a very nice horse. Um, you have Imprimis, um, who is following the same pattern that he did the past two years with Joe Orsino, uh, you know, training him for Breeze Easy. And then, um, you know, got Stormy who won the four-star Dave against the boys, trying to her hand again against the boys with Tyler Gaffleone aboard um, in that grade three uh, turf sprint race. And, uh, you know, be it's a really nice group top to bottom. And I think it's must-see rate, you know, watching, uh, you know, for uh, for Sunday racing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all about the turf this weekend at, at Kentucky Downs, the European turf. Um, it's like, I said, it's the big, uh, you know, arc preview day, you would say, uh, to compare it to something that, you know, phrase that we have over here for these, these big days before the big days um, at long shops, there's a bunch of, of, of group one and group two races. Also the matron stakes uh, for two year olds is another group one overseas this, this weekend. So there's a lot of action. You might have to wake up a little bit early for some of it, maybe early for me. John's up at 6am um, every day, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all going to be all about the grass this week and, and it's going to be, it'll be fun to kind of see who runs big and who we think, you know, we'll, we'll talk next week about who we think projecting forward is going to be a factor in the Breeders' Cup. Because I think now we're gradually going to turn the page from Saratoga and Del Mar for the Breeders' Cup. And there's a hell of a lot to talk about and a hell of a lot of divisions that are very interesting as we move toward the first weekend in November at Del Mar. A few things we have to mention before we, we sign off. Uh, J. David Richardson, who was a longtime owner and breeder, um, and racing died uh, September 7th earlier this week at Saratoga, unfortunately, uh, due to pneumonia complications from COVID-19. I know a lot of people had a lot of great things to, to say about him. I didn't know him personally, but there was a profile on the TDN a couple of years ago. ago. He was a brilliant surgeon. And, I, and you know, there, there's quotes in the article. You should go read it about how, how many lives he saved, thousands of lives potentially because he was he was so great and such a great doctor. And he was obviously very loved. Um, in the industry. So condolences to, to everybody that, that knew him and, and loved him. Um, we're losing, we're losing too many people, too many, too many pillars of, of this industry. And, uh, and one other thing to, to mention is we're doing a little ch charity fundraiser thing at the TDN for race to give, which is a fundraiser that's spearheaded um, by Haggard's to raise money for aftercare. The money's going to go to the thoroughbred charities of America, do great work. And they're going to divide it up amongst accredited aftercare organizations. Obviously that's something everybody in racing should be about and be behind. Uh, TDN is one of the six pillar organizations that they asked to help. There's going to be other teams after that. So they, we're going to form a team and we're uh, the staff's going to pitch in and donate. Um, and we're going to, we're going to create like a fun challenge out of it. And you can learn more at race to give.org. We're going to pop it up on the screen as well. Um, and you can learn more at, at that site as the, as the challenge as the fun Razor take sheet. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland September sale starts next Monday. You can learn more at the world's yearling sale. Com, make plans to be there or have your reps be there for you. Uh, I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, your Green Group guest of the week, Steve Asmussen, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Lee LaRocca, Anthony LaRocca. And Nathan Wilkinson, thank you so much for watching. I promise, not next week, but we'll be back in the studio eventually. See you then.